Hi, welcome to WesleyGospel.com. I'm going to continue my uh, spiritual experiences part, uh, part two. I had a little bit of a detour uh, between the last time I did part one and this one because I realized that I had, uh, you know, it's been, it's been about, I would imagine about 13 years since I uh, put this first manuscript together. Let me just see here. 23 is 13. Yeah, about about that. Um, and uh, this is like the top thing I've, you know, that's been downloaded off my site over the years. I've put out so many, I've gone in so many different directions. I've tried to write on pastoring. I've tried to write on parenting. I've tried to write on salvation. I've tried to write on uh, paranormal lights. Uh, I've tried to write on, uh, actually, honestly, my angel sparkles, the supernatural light subject, that has been viewed the most, uh, the article version. But as far as, as far as a download is concerned, I'm, it's still this How to Experience God PDF I put together. I'm really getting into the meat of How to Experience God. I mean, it's my guess that the, the reason why this PDF has been downloaded so much is just so that they people could read chapter three, this spiritual experiences section, because there's such a need for Catholic mystical theology today. And even when it does get communicated, it gets filtered. You know, you might see it at Barnes and Noble in the religion section, and it's getting communicated through this comparative religions garbage, right? It's not it's not being passed through Wesleyan theology. Or, or even Puritan theology. There's only one person that I know of in the Reformed tradition today that is mediating uh, Catholic mystical theology through Reformed, and that would be Tom Schwanda. He wrote a book called Soul Recreation uh, some time ago, and I think I still have that on my ebook section, and it was endorsed by J.I. Packer. I think J.I. Packer endorsed it if I'm not mistaken. Um, let me look that up. And what Tom Schwanda did uh, is he was an academic, uh, much more academic than myself. Yep, forward by J.I. Packer. He took Isaac Ambrose's book, uh, Looking Unto Jesus. And he analyzed it very, very closely and by the way, Looking Unto Jesus was strongly recommended by Leonard Ravenhill. He analyzed Looking Unto Jesus very closely and came to the conclusion that it was a Puritan mystical theology book. And very unique in that sense. And this was not a Quaker. This was a Puritan, all right? A Puritan mystical theology book. Based around Hebrews 12:2, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, using that as the basis for the contemplative object, Jesus, his face. And, uh, and he said, in looking unto Jesus, and I think he had another, uh, uh, other writings, like uh, Media Ultima or something like this, but he goes into the mystical experiences. I don't know if it's going to be the full spectrum like I'm going to go into here, but um, it's it's a starting point. I mean, most Baptistic and, um, and or Presbyterian spiritualities have no place for mystical experience. Now, if you're really looking into the past, you might think Jonathan Edwards. But everybody wants to stay away from Jonathan Edwards because of all of his hellfire preaching. But the thing about Jonathan Edwards is they also had this mystical element about him that people don't realize. Uh, that he, he really had a pretty well-developed uh, charismatic theology of the Holy Spirit. Although, last time I checked, Jonathan Edwards, if I were to compare him to anybody today, pro uh, probably John Piper. But even then... He seems to be more charismatic than John Piper because Jonathan Edwards allowed for people to be slain in the spirit. He didn't use the expression slain in the spirit. He, he called it the failing of bodily strength. But, um, I mean, there's no, there no way to get, get around it. There were strong outpourings of the Holy Spirit 
Once he, once he started preaching the Lordship, salvation, and gospel, the Spirit of God came to confirm that word with signs following. And people, uh, especially his wife, uh, would, would just fall out and uh, have visions of heaven. She was so acquainted with visions of heaven, she just got in the habit of calling it the upper world. Uh, so um, anyway... There is, there is basis for this. If you're from a Baptistic background, I'm telling you, I'm not pointing in a dangerous direction. I'm, I'm pointing you in a better direction. All right? I'm pointing you away from Baptistic deism, right? Like, like, like John, Jack Deere admitted. Jack Deere, need I remind you, was one of the top Bible scholars at Dallas Theological Seminary in the 90s. He was one of the contributors to the Bible Knowledge Commentary. But he joined the vineyard, and he became the top charismatic theologian of the 90s. And, and, and Jack Deere says in his book, Surprised by the Voice of God, Chapter 17, that, that Baptistic American Baptistic Christianity is, is Bible-based deism. Bible-based deism. And the only difference that Baptistic Christianity has with mainline liberalism is that it says miracles existed a long time ago. It's the only difference. Mainline liberalism says miracles never existed a long time ago. People just were mistaken in their perceptions. Baptistic Christianity says, no, 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 miracles existed a long time ago. That's the only difference only difference between today's Baptist Christianity and mainline liberalism. So when it comes to contemporary miracles or even miracles in revivals that happened under Jonathan Edwards, that naturalist presumption is still there. Uh, so we have to understand that. So if we are moving away from that kind of deism, that, that God is millions of miles away, as much as, as much as they view maybe the world was created millions of years ago, the idea of millions is very important, if not millions of dollars. Uh, you can make millions of dollars off the idea of millions of years ago. You can make millions of dollars off the idea of God being a million miles away. But if you start talking about, no, the world's only 6,000 years, if you start talking about God's right in front of us, and all you have to do is feel after him, Acts 17, you might not make a million dollars, but it'll be worth it. So I do want to say that what I am communicating here is Catholic mystical theology derived from the spiritual experiences of Catholic monks collated and systematized into a theological book called A Handbook on, Syst uh, Handbook on Mystical Theology by G.B. Scaramelli, who was a Jesuit theologian. He tried to point to the Bible as much as he could when he could. I would wish that he had done that more, but I tried to make up for that deficiency. He mainly focused on the lives of the saints for this, formulating his, uh, his theology of supernatural experiences. And so I, I think he, he did a pretty pretty darn good job at, at, at organizing that in a simple, to-the-point manner. Uh, and uh, with that being said, I am mediating this through a Wesleyan Pentecostal point of view. And as such, probably would not be very well received if I were to apply for a youth pastor job in Assemblies of God or Church of God. <laughs> because for the simple fact that uh, there are so many people in those denominations in leadership that come from Baptistic backgrounds. You know, a Baptist person gets baptized in the Holy Ghost and speaks with tongues. What are they going to do if they're in ministry? Well, they're going to join Assemblies of God, a Church of God. And, and while that's progress, there's still a lot of deistic hang-ups. And I've tried to, tried to explain the uh, self-contradicting dynamic that exists within institutional Pentecostalism. There's just a lot of resistance to the supernatural. It's like tongues, that's it. That's all we want to do. We don't want to get into the gifts of the Spirit. Because the moment we start doing that, it's trouble. It's not trouble. 
If not, it's not trouble if you follow 1 Corinthians chapter 14. There's a right way to go about it. And, and, and Thessalonians tells us not to quench the spirit, not to despise prophesying. And 1 Corinthians 14 says not to forbid people to speak in tongues. But you kind of get the feeling, even in the Pentecostal denominations, even in Assemblies of God, Church of God, and IPHC, International Pentecostal Holiness Church, even in these churches, there's still this kind of this... Ugh, this looming cloud of naturalism, baptistic deism kind of an attitude. It's still, still there. Just kind of hanging in there. Uh, and so a guy like me who believes in the full spectrum of mystical experience would never fit in with a crowd like that. Never. And I also believe that there's a time and place for stuff like Jonathan Edwards. There's a time and place for that. There really is. I truly believe that speaking on hell, I'm not kidding, I, preaching at least 10 lengthy sermons on hell, if not a year, then, you know, over the course of two years, is extremely profitable spiritually for, the, for our congregation. Um, uh, I have, no, now you shouldn't do it, you should do overboard, but it should be enough to where um, you know, there's plenty, plenty of people having, you know, a really strong understanding of hell, the doctrine of hell. And, and the best thing I could point to for something like that would be, number one, uh, a collection of Jonathan's sermons, uh, Jonathan Edwards' sermons on hell, which was called uh, The Wrath of Almighty God by Don Kistler. Um, and uh, there's another book called... Um, the Doctrine of Endless Punishment by W.G.T. Shedd. You start there, you can't go wrong. You know I mean, if you if you really drink that stuff for an entire week, you're going to be a burning Holy Ghost hellfire preacher by Sunday. Um, so uh, I, I I don't think though that you need to be doing that all the time. There's you know there's enough's enough. You know <laughs> you'll know when is enough. I mean I I've read through. Jonathan Edwards' Hellfire Sermons, I could only take so much. It gets to a point where you feel sick to your stomach. It's like, okay, this is too much. I just need to take a break from this, right? But uh, it needs to be preached. It needs to be preached for a really long time, too. I mean, that's what he did. I mean, he would just sit there, and he'd pull out his notes, and he would just take people through Scripture, through Scripture, and just ex theologically expound the doctrine of eternal punishment from the Puritan point of view. I mean, the doctrine of hell reached its high point during Puritanism. It reached its high point in the, in the uh, late 1600s, early 1700s. And after that point, it kind of just got watered down over time. But that was the high point. It really was. And Jonathan Edwards was the high point for that. Another good book on hell would probably be Size from Hell by John Bunyan. That's a pretty good one as well. Uh, so anyway, um, I, I'm coloring this with Puritanism for a very good reason. You might, like, John, just start talking about spiritual experiences already. I will. I will here in a moment. It's just I wanted to paint the picture, and I wanted to say, look, Unless you filter this stuff through Puritanism, it's not going to make sense and you're going to get confused real quick. Keep it grounded in the Puritan and or Wesleyan tradition. And once you do that, you have created a safe theological bubble for this sort of stuff. Okay, so now, spiritual experiences part two. I'm um, starting off here in how to experience God on... Um, uh, page 106, uh, experience 4.5, I'm talking about spiritual sleep, spiritual sleep. Now, a lot of these spiritual experiences, especially in the first um, uh, 10, uh, 10 of them, are coming straight out of Scaramelli, and, and they are uh, different kinds of, or maybe even different levels of uh, spiritual experiences that can, that can happen while you are in contemplative prayer and or Pentecostal 
spirit-filled Pentecostal worship, which is really just a different form of contemplative prayer. But it's the idea that fixing on fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2. Um, keeping your mind stayed on thee, right? Keeping your mind stayed on God, concentrated on God, focused on the Lord. Your eyes are not open. Um, it's not, you're not singing, um, you're not singing. It's not like you're, you know, in revival services, we often do Southern gospel, right? Where, where, where eyes are open and we're singing a song and that can transport people into these, into these states if and only if their eyes are shut and they're focused on the Lord. But if the singer, if the gospel singer's eyes are not shut and the gospel singer's not focusing on the Lord, he's not going to get that blessing. So th it's absolutely important to be in contemplation if you want to have, if you want to experience transport or any sort of a, you know, mild ecstatic experience of the Holy Spirit. And it's oftentimes very much helped through music, but Scaramelli is not talking about the context of music. He's talking about context of solitude, door is shut, and you're in absolute silence, isolation, and prayer. And, and, and when I say prayer, I usually do not mean Leonard Ravenhill type prayer where you're praying through a prayer list for lost souls. I'm talking about listening prayer, focusing on the Lord and just concentrating on the Lord and that's it. But the most, the, the easiest way to do this is Pentecostal and charismatic worship because the music, especially rhythmical and melodic rock band type music, will help you to get into the rhythm and focus and shut out all distractions, if your eyes are shut and you're focusing your mind on Jesus. There's an old Pentecostal song. With my mind focused on him. Da, da, da. Right? That's what we're doing here. So if we're doing that, we're not looking around. We're not looking at people around us. Our eyes are shut in prayer and worship. And our mind is focused on Jesus. It's totally okay to sing songs to the Lord while you're doing this a little bit, but you don't want to get caught up too much in lyricism and getting lost in words and songs and prayers. You, you want to focus your mind on the Lord. That's the absolute most important thing. You cannot lose your concentration. You've got to focus on the Lord. And the devil's going to try to distract you, and the flesh is going to try to distract you, and your family members are going to try to distract you. Focus on Jesus, so important. Or focus on the Father sitting on the throne. Or focus on the Holy Spirit surrounding you. Whatever it takes, make sure that you're focusing on the triune God that's mentioned in the Bible. So uh, you're either seeking God's face, or you know, you're, you're picturing the face of Jesus as you understand it, and you're focusing your mind on that. Right? You know, some Baptists are against images of God because of the Ten Commandments. That's their interpretation. So what you can do is what they did in the Cloud of Unknowing, which is an old contemplative book, where they would just picture the Holy Spirit surrounding the Cloud of the Lord, and you could focus on that. But this is what's going on. You're doing that. That is active contemplation. You're reaching out. You're feeling out after him. You're, maybe you're raising your hands up if and only if you feel like the Spirit wants you to do that. And... Uh, you're being led to raise your hands up, right? You're not raising your hands up just to raise your hands up. You're being led to raise your hands up without wrath and doubting, all right? Because the Holy Spirit is giving you a compulsion to raise your hands up. And your mind is focused on him and your eyes are shut. So this is contemplation. This is what the Catholics call contemplation. It's what they call contemplative prayer, but it's what we Pentecostals call just worship. It's what we call worship. Okay, so spiritual sleep, what is it? This is an authentic spiritual experience in the ecstasy and trance category. This is being slain in the spirit. So what the Catholics used to call spiritual sleep, we Pentecostals call being slain in the spirit. Slain in the spirit is Biblical, 2 Chronicles 5.14, the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Now, you don't have to see the Holy Spirit as a bright white light filling up the church in order for you to fall down. That's rare. All you got to do is feel it real strong. And so if you feel it real strong, real strong, ain't no way 
your body's going to be strong enough to stand up. It's going to lose all of its strength in a moment, and no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you try to stand up, you will not be able to stand up. You will faint, and you will fall to the floor because you won't have the strength to stand up any longer. Now, it is absolutely true that slain in the spirit, a.k.a. what the Catholic monks used to call spiritual sleep, Get, 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 get this here. Catholic monks used to be slain in the spirit. Catholic monks in medieval times used to fall out under the power. Get this in your head. St. Francis of Assisi walking around in a, you know, St. Francis of Assisi walking around in a, uh, in a monk outfit. And he gets slain in the spirit. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. This stuff used to happen to those guys. So this is not made up. This is authentic. You know, the Pope put his stamp of approval on this like centuries ago. This has been going on a really long time. Slain in the Spirit is ancient. It's biblical. It has continued throughout church history constantly. All right, so, okay. That being said, can it be faked? Absolutely, it can be faked. I've faked it before several times because I didn't know better. I, I thought that, you know, I'm an Arminian, right? So I'm, I don't want, I want to be the polar opposite of people who are anti-charismatic. You know, Stephen said to the Pharisees, he was rebuking them right before he got martyred. Acts 7, he says, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Right? And then they martyred him. Well, I want to be the opposite of that. I don't want to resist the Holy Spirit. I want to receive the Holy Spirit. I want to accept the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, not only me, but a lot of other uh, uh, Pentecostal people, they they just they just make themselves extremely like they're in these prayer states, right? And somebody's going and praying for people to receive the Holy Spirit by laying it on hands, and and they get overboard in their receptivity, and they just let people just tip them over, you know. They just let them tip them over. I've done that several times. I've done that a handful of times, and I feel stupid every time I do it. Um, but that's not a genuine experience of saying the Spirit. <laughs> the genuine spiritual sleep is where there's absolutely none of that kind of flaky sort of just getting – you know, turning yourself into a, a reed that can be tipped over real easy. Okay. You don't need to do that. There's nothing spiritual about that. Okay. And it, and it says nothing about your attitude other than that you, um, you still haven't really received this experience yet. <laughs> That's all it means. Your attitude's in the right place. You're just misguided. Okay. You don't have to pretend to fall over to receive slain in the spirit. It doesn't work that way. All you need to do is have the right attitude about it and pray that you experience it someday. Uh, so sometimes uh, the Catholic mystics would, would refer to Song of Solomon 5.2. I don't like referring to the Song of Solomon for mystical experiences because I personally believe that Song of Solomon is erotic poetry, that it's a love poem. Um, but throughout the um, uh, throughout the middle Middle Ages, it was interpreted, it was reinterpreted symbolically about spiritual experiences with the Holy Spirit, and I think that that's wrong. Uh, but they would oftentimes point to Song of Solomon 5:2, "I sleep, but my heart is awake," and that is true. That's it's using biblical terminology out of its original context, it does accurately uh, uh, communicate uh, what slain in the spirit is, trance, right? You're, you're in a sleepiness, but you're not all the way asleep, right? You're, you're a little bit aware of your physical surroundings, but you're also not. You're also way more aware of God's spirit. Uh, have you ever fainted before? Have you ever had uh, a blackout before? That's kind of what's, what's going on here. It's like, like everything, just kind of like your your eyes are shut, right? And uh, it's almost like you're 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 half asleep. It's like you're not quite as you're not quite all the way asleep, but you're almost there. And and a lot of people experience something similar to this when they're waking out of a dream, or sometimes you have a dream or something, 
and you wake up out of it real slow. And it's like that moment where you're waking up out of it 50%. That's what slain in the spirit's like. It's like you're not quite awake and you're not quite asleep. And uh, and but at the same time, there's sleep paralysis as well. Now, I have experienced sleep paralysis coming out of a dream that was full of the Holy Spirit. I had the Holy Spirit all over me out of a dream one time, and uh, I was experiencing sleep paralysis when I came out of it. And that's part of the slain, slain in the spirit. Is it, you can't move. Your arms and legs are completely in sleep paralysis because your body hasn't quite come out of the REM state. Uh, all right, so that's uh, the spiritual sleep, a.k.a. slain in the spirit. And uh, now I'm going to move on to some other stuff here. Now, uh, the next spiritual experience uh, after slain in the spirit is actually spiritual dryness. What? I mean, I thought we were supposed to just have nothing but slain in the spirit the rest of our life. And now you're talking about spiritual dryness? We were on this side of the pendulum. Now we're going to swing the pendulum to the total opposite side? You're telling me that the spiritual life is bipolar? A little bit, yeah. Unfortunately. And anybody who's been baptized in the Holy Ghost knows this. Well, they, they called this several things. They called it spiritual dryness. And they called it the thirst of love. They also called it aridity. And they called it the dark night of the soul. St. John of the Cross called it that. So there's there's at least there's a handful of names for this. Uh, Pentecostals call it being dry. You know. Uh, so we uh, we get that, you know. Uh, this is the absence of the presence, of feeling the presence of God. You felt it before. It's a distant memory, and oh, how you wish that you could feel the presence of God again. That's actually a spiritual experience. You might not think that. You might think, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46, Jesus was not able to feel the presence of God on the cross. He experienced it. Even he experienced it. Right? You might say, why? Why is this part of the Christian spiritual life? I don't know. It just is. <laughs> it just is. <laughs> we just have to deal with it. But I think that, um, now John Wesley had a theory. And uh, there's a book on John Wesley's uh, charismatic theology. It's called um, – it's not the best thing I've read. Um, it's not as good as Supernatural Occurrences of John Wesley, but this is still worth a read. Uh, um, it's a book by Robert Tuttle. It's called Mysticism in the Wesleyan Tradition. And in that, John Wesley uh, theorized that people sin their way – out of the presence of God. That was, that's, that was his theory. Um, he believes that not feeling God's presence is the result of sinning. It makes sense to me. Um, you know, it might be because of grieving the Holy Spirit. You know, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, right? Uh, it makes sense to me. Um, I have, I can, I can attest in my own personal life that um, the more business-like I've become, the more distracted I've become about personal finance, the more temptations I've had to be put through. You know, what happens is that you're not doing contemplation enough. It's, you, you know, it's the absence of contemplation, in my opinion, that really brings this lack of the presence of God. The lack of truly concentrated, focused on the Lord Pentecostal worship is really what makes it, uh, it, it uh, you, you lose that presence of God. You're just not doing it enough. And also, you're just as distracted mentally and emotionally as you can possibly be. You, you can't break through to the presence of God when you're in that kind of a state. It's just not possible. Uh, and, um, and then, you know, what does it say in Genesis? In sin, lieth at the door. As well, so you just—it's distraction. It's just distraction. It's not—it's not that you're personally failing. That 
you know, that any, anybody, you know, we're not talking about perfectionism. I don't believe in perfectionism. I don't believe you have to be perfect in order to experience the Holy Ghost and be saved. I don't believe that more for one moment. I just believe you've got to not be distracted from spirit-filled contemplation and worship. You can't be distracted from that or it ain't going to work. And you're going to lose your sensitivity to the Holy Spirit if you allow yourself to get distracted by earthly cares. That's my opinion. And I think John Wesley's also right. Because it's the Holy Spirit you're trying to feel after. And if you're living unholy, it doesn't even make sense for you guys to be like meeting each other. So it does make sense. However, what is holy? Well, I would say, generally speaking, it means loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And second to that, trying as hard as you can to keep the Ten Commandments in your heart. Uh, that being said, also reading the Bible a whole lot and trying to live by it. So uh, that being said, you know, but it, you can get distracted. It's distraction, in my opinion, it is, it is disobedience, it is temptation, it is anxiety, and it is depression, and most of all, it is distraction from Pentecostal and charismatic worship that makes people lose their sense of the presence of God. Yeah. And I can tell you, I mean, I'm there. I've only had very brief intermissions of feeling God's presence in the past 10 years, and it's kind of tragic. And it's, it's on me, you know. I've allowed my private prayer life to uh, decline. And because um, I'm just so anxious all the time, you know. That anxiety, the obsession on worries and cares. You know, Jesus talked about it this way. He said, the seed that is sowed among thorns represents the cares, the anxieties, and the worries, the financial worries, and the deceitfulness of wealth that come in and they choke the word, making it unfruitful. You know. And that's dangerous stuff. It's dangerous territory. But it's just honest. But if you still hunger and thirst, if you still have a hunger and a thirst to be a God chaser, like Tommy Tenney said, if you still have a hunger and a thirst for the pursuit of God, like A.W. Tozer said, if you still have a hunger and thirst for the baptism in the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues, and you just can't go another day without God's presence, that means you still have the Holy Spirit inside you. And that is the Holy Spirit groaning with words, groaning inside of you, uh, and you, that you cannot express in words. Romans chapter 8. Groans that words cannot express. That is that is you yearning and thirsting. God, I'm dry. Please give me the presence of God. Please. Please, Lord God, help me, God. Even just for one second. Please, just one second of your presence. That's a spiritual experience. It's called spiritual dryness. It's called the thirst of love. Why is it called the thirst of love? Because you're thirsting for the love of the Holy Spirit. You're thirsting for the, the presence of that divine love. You need a hug from God right now. And it's called a dark night of the soul. Because it feels like you're just in the dark. God, depressed. Depressed. Where's the presence of God when you need it? It's called aridity. Because you're in an arid desert region. There's just no moisture here. I want that humid. I want that dank. I want that thick presence of God now. I want to be in the water, the living water of God's presence. Where is it, God? I'm so dry. I'm like My lips are cracked and dry. I'm in the desert. God, help. Jesus. That's the thirst of love. The thirst for God's presence. That's his spiritual experience. It's good if you're having that. Um, let's see if I have enough time to go into, I'm going to go into one more experience. Boy, this is going to be a long series. One more experience. Experience uh, 4.7 is divine touches. The divine touch, spontaneously experiencing a feeling of God's presence. This is what you're thirsting for. Finally, you get it. 
Usually this is going to happen during worship, Pentecostal praise and worship. And it's going to come, the Holy Spirit just touches you. It's for a moment. It has a starting point, it has a middle point, and it has an end point. It might last for three seconds, five seconds, ten seconds, whatever. But it's definitely a heightened awareness of God's presence near you. And uh, and there's there you completely can tell that there's a difference. It wasn't there before, but now it's there, and you're so happy. Oh my gosh! You feel the love. You feel the 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 um, the comfort. You feel the comfort of the Holy Ghost. You feel the presence. You feel the holiness and the reverence and the awesome power of of His Lordship. The fear of the Lord. All right. Not afraid of God like he's a monster, just fear because he's majestic, right? And uh, it's like it's there for a couple seconds, and you're so happy, and you're just praising God, and you feel like praising God in tongues. And you have absolute undivided attention and spiritual consciousness of God, of his existence, his presence all around you, and it's just wonderful. But believe it or not, the more you do this, the more you reach out to feel after him, the more you experience this in Pentecostal worship, contemplative prayer, what have you, guess what? This can happen at random times of the day. You can be out at Walmart, da da da, you know, going to get your groceries, and pow, Holy Ghost, and you feel it all over you. And it's like, yes, thank you, Lord. You can experience it while driving the car. Uh, it just depends upon how much time. You're willing to give to Pentecostal worship and or isolated contemplative prayer. God bless you out there. This is John with WesleyGospel.com.